What is going on guys? My name is Matthew Veer and welcome back to volume 24 of the In The Style Of series. This time, reverse engineering the sound of no such thing. This is the composition I'm going to be taking you through today. To give this video some semblance of structure, I'm going to be talking about this track in five distinct categories, which will be the groups of the instruments present in this project. Broadly speaking, we've got drums, vocals, synths, bass, and field recordings. And then I'd like to also cover some mastering and my five key takeaways at the end. Within each chapter, I'm also going to be covering six topics. And these include theory, instrumentation, sound design, sound selection, arrangement, and mixing. Everything is timestamped in the description and the pinned comment, so you can skip around if you wish. I'll start with the drums and then work my way down the project. Here's how they sound soloed. You've probably already noticed, but I'm still running Ableton 9, which means I don't have the groups within groups feature. My groups are grouped by drum and are not also nested in one global drum group for the whole groove. However, if you are running 10, I would recommend that you group them twice to give yourself more control over what's going on, as well as achieving a better end result. For the most part, no such thing's choice of kick drums are pretty subdued. He doesn't like to draw attention to them, leaving you to drift off into the atmosphere of his sonic worlds. Now, of course, everything I'm going to be saying is my own take on his sound after spending the last month immersing myself in his discography, being taken on the journey that each track provides. It was a fun month, to say the least. A subdued kick drum to me is one that has a low fundamental frequency. 60 hertz would be optimal, with little to no high end present. Think of an 808 without a long decay. This is the one that I've made for this project. No such thing hasn't set any hard and fast rules about his choice of kicks, or really anything in his work.
Tracks like Way We Were have kick drums layered with hi-hats for added presence, and even kick drums in stereo with reverb applied on tracks like Fog, which, by the way, is a glorious listen on headphones. In the mixing world, keeping low frequency sounds in mono is usually the advice many follow, and for good reason. There are a multitude of problems that can occur if you don't, such as phasing issues like masking or alignment, and there's even some weird things that our ears do with the sound localization of low frequencies. My point here is that that he walks into the studio every day with a beginner's mind, meaning he has an attitude of openness, eagerness, and a lack of preconceptions when working on his music, even at his advanced level, just as a beginner would. It's some food for thought when you next open Ableton. I wasn't going for a similar sound to Fog, so I decided to play it safe and keep my kick drum in mono, which is what this utility plugin down here is doing. I've always preached the importance of finding the closest to perfect sample you can before applying any effects. Depending on how geeky you want to get about this topic, EQs introduce phase delay and other audible artifacts, commonly referred to as colour. And while this can be desirable, I have specific EQs I go to for that. For a surgical EQ, this isn't something I'm looking for, hence the need of finding the right sample to begin with. What I'm saying is, make the fewest cuts in the EQ you can to ensure the cleanest version of your sample. One thing that I don't understand about Ableton's EQ is why the spectrum doesn't go down low enough graphically to actually see the cut I'm making. It looks like I'm not removing anything here. However, on FabFilter's EQ, you can see that I'm removing everything under 30Hz. You could even take this up to 40Hz or perhaps 50 My reasoning for this is simply headroom. Headroom is essentially how much clean volume signal you have before your track peaks and it stores. This track isn't being released, but I still follow the principles all the same. The low end represents a significant amount of the total energy of a song. And if you want something loud, you need to have the headroom available before it goes to mastering. To really understand the importance of low end in our mixes, I think it's first important to understand that we do not hear all frequencies equally at different overall volume levels. A familiar example of this is the extra low end you hear when you turn up your stereo speakers or your headphones. The additional bass is not a product of your sound system. Our ears are just better able to hear the long wavelengths of bass frequencies when the volume is turned up to a high level. Since this is the perfect segue, I'd like to talk about the equal loudness contour, sometimes referred to as the Fletcher Munson curve, which, fun fact by the way, is actually two different people, Fletcher and Munson. I always presume that it was a single person with a double barreled name. Anyway, the reason I want to speak about this is because it affects all of the elements in our music, or more specifically, how our auditory system responds to our music and everything we are hearing. What you're seeing on screen is the equal loudness contours, a very important chart used for everything from microphone design to developing codecs like MP3 and is useful at least on an intuitional level when one is building up a mix. The curves on this graph represent an average of human hearing at volume levels spanning from the lowest curve at about 20 dB SPL, that's sound pressure level, to the highest at 90 dB SPL. For our purposes, there are a couple of fundamental points to take away from this chart. Firstly, our perception of the balance of low to high frequencies is never even, but it is more so at higher volumes. Conversely, we struggle to hear bass frequencies at low listing levels, so be careful mixing at a quiet level something you intend to play back at 90 to 100 dB SPL at a club. Otherwise, the bass is just going to be out of control at those higher volumes. No such thing as music is probably best experienced at his live shows, and he, like many artists, have understood this equal loudness and took the necessary precautions when mixing their music. But it is equally important that you don't listen to your music too loud while mixing, as moderate listeners will hear too little bass in your music. There's a fine balance between the two. Somewhere around peaking at 85 to 90 dB SPL when monitoring in the studio is a good target zone, so make sure you calibrate your system. This also applies to headphone users too if you want your mix to translate well across all mediums. I'm going to segue here into the snare as the second point ties in with it perfectly. The same EQ and compression configuration has been applied there too, so we're not missing anything out. I'll play the snare drum first and then speak about this second principle of the equal loudness contours.
There are two zones in which we are particularly sensitive. 3 to 4 kilohertz is the most sensitive area of our hearing. It is where our ear canal naturally resonates. Incidentally, and not surprisingly, this is where consonants critical to our speech reside. If I play this snare again, muted in the background, you can see we've got a peak hitting directly in the middle of this range. Adding anything in this range with EQ or resonance on a filter will bring it to the forefront of the mix, but use it sparingly, like you would a strong spice. The next pronounced dip occurs around 12k, the upper limits of the graph around here. This is a good spot to exploit because we are sensitive there, but not nearly as much as 3 to 4 kilohertz. Technically, it is the third harmonic of the 4 kilohertz resonance. I have indeed exploited this 12k region for the hats, but we'll talk about them in just a moment. Firstly, I'd like to cover the sound selection and processing on these snares. I actually made these snares by hitting a tree repeatedly with a large branch in a fairly open forest. This time of year, all the leaves have fallen off the trees, giving us the perfect chance to capture some natural reverb in fairly open forests or spaces without the dampening effect leaves provide. You can see me here damaging trees in the name of music, I actually ended up staying past dark but started getting some Stranger Things vibes so decided to call it a day. I had captured around 250 hits in total but I kept thinking I could get a better one. I ended up narrowing it down to around 20 and put the best 15 in the sample library and used the best two here. I guess what I'm trying to say is train yourself to think differently than the crowd when approaching music. I obviously couldn't say for certain no such thing records his rimshot snares in this way, although he's used a beautiful snare in his In Your Eyes remix. Point being, the common thought for acquiring a snare will be to browse your sample library, perhaps even make one if you have a little more time. I've not yet met anyone who suggested we go into the forest and start hitting trees. That's not to say I'm special or any more creative than the next person. I stole the idea from Leon Switch from Cryptic Minds when he spoke at my college. A quote from Austin Cleon, neatly sums up my point here. Be curious about the world in which you live. Look things up. Chase down every reference. Go deeper than anybody else. That's how you'll get ahead. Alright, if me smacking trees for three hours straight wasn't enough for you, I've got something else I'd like to share. One thing I struggled with on the snares was whether to keep them in stereo or convert them to mono. In the sample pack, I've kept both versions, but I went with stereo here. My decision was being hindered by phase correlation. Now, phase describes the combination of two identical or very similar sounds separated by a time interval. Saying two waves are out of phase is less useful than saying they are 90 or 180 degrees out of phase, both of which have very different consequences. However, in the spirit of not overcomplicating, in matters, it's only problematic in this case in the low end, sub 250 hertz ish. Remember everything I mentioned about kick drums and low end earlier? All that applies here, which is why if your lines are moving independently, it needs to be addressed. I was happy going with the stereo snares in this instance, but make sure you check when building out your own project. A healthy compromise might be to mono everything under 250 hertz, the low frequencies, while keeping everything above nice and wide in stereo. This can be achieved through using Ableton's mid side option on Ableton's EQ for example. I get messages often asking some version of how do I get my drums to bang more? It's a fair question and often comes down to phasing issues. While no such thing isn't known for his banging drums, although I'd imagine you'd feel them at his live shows, he is known for very clean music, particularly in his drum patterns. We spoke about why I'm removing some of the low frequencies from sounds that don't require them and that is a good general practice, removing anything that you don't need in order to have more headroom on the master phase. The cut at 500Hz to me removes many of the what I call muddy frequencies. Now, this will depend on your ears. You may want to remove some around 200Hz or perhaps even higher than 500Hz. The idea is to just clean up the sound. EQ can be used like a polishing tool to get the sound to sit right with everything else in your mix. Try not to EQ on solo too. It's much better to do it within the contents of the whole mix. The glue compressor is an obvious choice for when working inside of Ableton. Cytomic teamed up with Ableton to make the device, which was modelled on the SSL bus compressor. This was the compressor that came on the master fader of an SSL console back in the 1980s. In an interview with Future Music, no such thing said how much he likes using the API 2500 stereo compressor, as well as the SSL G Master Bus Compressor plugin on the master. He mentions UAD, who make a plugin emulation of the API 2500 500, as do Waves, and I'm sure there are others out there too. 
The actual settings of the compressor are obviously signal dependent. These settings are for my particular snare and the sound I was trying to achieve. For the most part, I'm always looking to compress the initial transient of a drum hit. So I've set the attack to the lowest it will go, which is actually the default for this compressor. My general rule for the amount of compression on drums is a medium ratio, 4 to 1 is usually perfect. I'll then drag the threshold down until I'm getting around 4 decibels of gain reduction. Sometimes I'll crank this up to 6, 7 or even 8, depending on the sound I'm going for. I think it's important to remember that when properly used, a compressor can shape your sound, giving it an entirely new character. The only issue with using a glue compressor on drums is the incredibly slow release times. These release times are in seconds. Normally compressors have them in milliseconds, but because this is a bus compressor, they're much longer. Just to give you an example, a slow release time would usually be considered anything over 400 milliseconds, which is 0.4 of a second. This bus compressor's fastest setting is 1000 milliseconds, so the fastest release time on this thing is still two and a half times slower than a normal slow release. You may want to consider this when using it on drums, but because these hits are pretty spaced out, I didn't run into any issues, but for more syncopated rhythms, you'd want something much faster. The final plugin on this chain is a delay. It was an 8-note delay, as you can see from the original on the right here. I guess half of it still is. I played around until I got something pretty unobtrusive when played in the context of the whole mix, but just filled in between the gaps of the snare. Here's a quick before and after. And after. Mixing wise, I noticed that no such thing seems to keep his snares super clean and up front in the mix, sometimes being the loudest single sound in there. Simple loudness can often be the best method for achieving this, just ensuring your snare is louder than everything else. But I also opted to sidechain the snare to everything that could obstruct it frequency wise to ensure nothing was masking or competing with it. Moving on to the percussion group, which sounds like so. The percussion comprises of two hats and a shaker. Now don't worry, I won't take as long on these as I have on the kick and the snare. I think the shaker's kind of cool though. Here's how they sound, soloed. The first thing you'll probably notice is the lack of EQ and compression. I've applied that to the group channel and didn't feel the shaker needed anything surgically applying to them. Judge each situation on a case by case basis. I'm using these two compressors to sidechain the shakers to the kick and the snare, meaning the shaker will dip momentarily in volume when the kick or snare is playing. The length of the size of the dip in volume, as well as how fast it occurs and how quickly it recovers are controlled by the threshold, attack, and release parameter, respectfully. I've repeated this side chaining on the percussion bus, but to a much lighter extent. If I play everything muted, you can see how extreme the side chaining is. I'm getting away with this and it not really being audible due to the combination of the next two plugins. I've noticed in many of No Such Things records, he's got sounds almost moving around the speakers going from left to right, which is particularly obvious on headphones. In fact, how he plays with stereo imaging is a big part of his sound. To emulate that, I've got the auto pan with the around the head preset doing just that. Ableton doesn't have a dedicated stereo imaging plugin, so this auto pan is your best bet if you're just working inside of Ableton. I know people are going to get mad in the comments about me not sticking to Ableton only plugins, and I'm sorry, but there just aren't any other plugins on earth that can do what these two do, or at least as well as they do it. Sound Toys regularly have plugins on sale for $30, of which I've picked up a couple over this last year and then upgraded to the full bundle for $140 on Black Friday. So if you're vigilant and wait until the sales, it doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, I feel like it's okay to recommend plugins I'm enjoying, right? I'm not sponsored by them or anyone in fact, but even if I was, I'd always be honest about it. 
The first plugin is a infinitely customizable resonant filter plugin that brings together the sounds of classic filter hardware. I did try to replicate part of this effect by using the two auto filters devices each set on bandpass filters, one starting low and working its way up to 20k over 16 bars and the other doing the opposite. However, I just couldn't get it to sound anything like what I'd previously got in the Filter Freak plugin. I would recommend checking out the free plugins over on maxforlive.com. They've got a pretty extensive repository of mostly free plugins which all work in Ableton 10 and 9 and below if you own Max for Life. Describing what this plugin is doing really wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. It's best heard in action. And then after. The difference speaks for itself. I haven't heard a whole lot of shakers used in No Such Things music. He tends to keep the percussion chopped into single hits rather than ongoing loops, and I believe this is to create space in his drum grooves between the hits. How No Such Thing uses space is something we'll cover in more detail a little later on. But because of this, I didn't want the shaker to always be there. Also, Pam wasn't enough. I needed them to disappear, but not with volume, as that would be too obvious to the listener. I needed something more subtle with more movement. I got there through chance in the end, really, just going through the presets in the device and then tweaking them until I had something that worked. Out of the two Sound Toys plugins, this one is providing the movement via the filtering. The next plugin is providing the interest with delay. This was one of my favourite plugins before filming this tutorial and I'll explain why. I've always thought of this plugin as magic. I didn't know exactly what it did and I didn't care. I just loved experimenting with it on tracks to see what the results would be. Upon researching into the mechanics, the magic was revealed. I got a look under the cloth if you will. It's a little like when a magician reveals how he performs your favourite trick. You suddenly realise that magic doesn't actually exist and lose interest in that once favourite trick and possibly the magician too. I found out that technically this plugin is defined as a granular echo synthesizer but it's much more than just that. What Crystallizer does essentially is that it grabs a slice of stereo or mono audio coming in from the input and then plays it back either forward or in reverse with the ability to shift the pitch of the audio slice four octaves up or four octaves down. It also includes the ability to delay the playback of the audio by up to two seconds, and most importantly, use regeneration or recycle to feed the output back into the input, allowing you to create some radical and beautiful effects on all sorts of input signals. The reason I'm telling you all of this is because I want you to understand what you're hearing when I before and after the shakers. So firstly, before. And then after. I've got the dry wet control turned down to keep things subtle, but you get the idea. You're always left with an entirely new sound that could be resampled. Ableton does have a grain delay, and I did play with it, but I just couldn't in this instance get quite what I wanted out of it. Someone who's prepared to sit with it for longer may be able to though. Ableton's plugins are some of the best stock plugins, even better than many third party options, but I think it's fair to say that sometimes you just want something a little different. All this to say that this was my attempt at cheap a shaker loop into a in the style of no such thing track, essentially to give me more tones and sounds to play with. The thing I love about no such things music is that he has his bass sounds, but then throughout the track, it's like new sounds are born out of them. It creates a very organic, smooth sounding track that doesn't sound like it's been written in bars, copied and pasted to fill out three minutes. Rather than bringing in new sounds, try creating new variations of something that's already in there. Just experiment, resample, and create something anew. Onto the hats, which are just straight hats. I'll play you them, and then the tom drum, and then we'll move on to the group processing. I'll cover the arrangement of the whole drum groove in just a second, but going back to what I said about the space no such thing leaves in his drum grooves, I went with very clear single hits with an extremely simple rhythm. Here's the tom drum.
It's just a tom, no reason to spend much time on it. I will say, however, that no such thing seems to use toms as well as ghost snares throughout his work. Now, obviously, tons of other artists do too, but again, harking back to the single hits theory, he seems to prefer them over loops. And when I say loops, I don't necessarily mean pre-made ones from sample libraries. It's more the distinction you can hear here compared to a drama like drum and bass. You can hear every hit in his work. Everything is so tight and well controlled, but not in an over way. Perhaps the space helps with this too. On to the group processing. I've covered all of these plugin configurations earlier in different sections, so in order to not repeat myself, I won't go over them again now. But I would like to say that sidechaining your kick and snare drum to the percussion groove can provide an extra layer of shuffle. You've got the arrangement of your percussion groove that's then moving around your main two drum hits. It can work pretty well, especially on beats in where much more is going on. I mentioned about keeping the snare clean and under unobstructed earlier. The same notion applies with the percussion. I don't want it getting in the way of the sounds I'm looking to keep up front. I've wanted to say this for a while, but all of the sounds in this project, not just the drums for the first time ever, but also 50 music sounds consisting of arps, pads, drones, atmospheres, etc., are available in the In the Style of Volume 24 sample library over on Samples by Vanity. Everything is, of course, as usual, in the style of the given artist. This time, of course, it's no such thing. I've just chosen to remove the artist names from the artwork moving forward. Also, what do you think of the new artwork design? I built this whole project around a template I created from No Such Things track, Realize. While this is far from being identical, which was never the intention, it serves more of a remix or my interpretation of that track. My reason for this was to not accidentally slip back into my own composing mind and start making choices based on what I liked and not that of what No Such Thing would use. I thought this track was a nice middle ground between his works and allowed me to construct a tutorial around, at the least, a track with whispers of a no such thing influence as I know everyone will interpret what I've made differently. I kept the drum pattern similar to that of the one in Realize, but did change out the snare for our rim shot and added in the shaker to glue everything together. It's worth noting that no such thing really doesn't have a formula he repeats. Sometimes it's a rim shot, another time it's a regular snare, another time it's something else entirely. His approach is fresh each time. This is an important ethos for us all to remember. Many professional composers who have huge huge templates with upwards of 1,000, sometimes even 2,000 channels or above, redesign it from project to project or even queue to queue to keep their sound fresh, original and interesting. We all get into the groove of going to our favourite synth or that drum library. I'm guilty of it and I'm yet to meet someone who hasn't been at some point in their career. Anyway, that's enough on the drums. I'd now like to move on to the vocals, which sound like this, soloed. I've got two different things going on here. The first of which will only take me a few seconds to explain. As I'm sure you spotted from the file name and potentially channel name, these samples come from Ariana Grande. The first is from her Break Free acapella and is quite literally the last vocal on the record. I'd love to claim that I did, but these vocals came with this kind of glitchy effect on them, which is part of the reason. I sampled them. The second sample is from a little earlier on in the same acapella. Both of these samples have then been pitch shifted to match the key of the track, which is G minor, but I'll get into some theory a little later though. All right, so why Ariana? I could have chosen any vocalist, why her? Well, in No Such Things track Get Like from his most recent album Parallels, I'm convinced that one of the vocal samples is Ariana saying, yeah, pitch down. There's no information online to confirm this. Maybe even someone could submit it to who sampled Sample.com. But for those that don't know, yeah is something Ariana seems to say a lot of in her records, so much so that there's 10 of them alone in her single God is a Woman, which I know because I sampled them all. Armed with this information, I did the appropriate thing that any respectable music producer would do in the same situation and try to recreate it. I did get it to sound pretty close, so I'm happy that I was indeed right, but because of the key difference, the sample unfortunately didn't work with this track. 
Because I'd already wasted half a day, I decided to find some of the samples to fit this project. I knew I wanted one to be chopped and made into an instrument, as this is a commonality in No Such Things records, at least when he samples vocals, that's normally how he chooses to process them. Before I move on to that though, let me just cover this EQ configuration. Do you ever hear a sound while wearing headphones that you thought came from outside the music? Perhaps you then take them off and listen for a few seconds to your environment. I've definitely done this hundreds of times in the studio over the years. Either this is normal behavior or I'm paranoid. Either way, it's similar to the kind of sound that you hear when you go to the toilets in a club or hear music coming from outside a near building. Exaggerated bass with little to no high frequencies. Low frequencies carry farther than high frequencies. The reason has to do with what's stopping the sound. If it weren't for attenuation or absorption, sound would follow an inverse square law. This basically just means that the high frequencies are just being absorbed between the sound source and their journey to your ears, whereas low frequencies are not absorbed as well. High frequencies are also better reflected, but low frequencies are able to pass through obstructions. This explains why when a car going past is bumping their music, we hear only low frequencies. I wanted this sound effect for a couple of reasons. The first was to try and create some depth in this mix. One way I like to do that is sit sounds rise at the back. Reverb and volume also help to accomplish the effect, but the EQ setup really works wonders just to capture it. You may have noticed in the introduction of the track, I've got a field recording of a busy French street. Recorded so you can't hear any specific dialogue. I then introduce the main synth line and slowly bring it up. It's being brought up in volume. I'm also introducing more of the high frequencies with an automated low pass filter and pulling the reverb send back. I started with the send on full, then have it dialing back when we're getting closer to the main section of the track. I did all this to make the synth sound sound like it was playing on the French street. The reverb helps simulate this effect as the closer you get to the source, the less reverb you will hear in this situation as it's playing outside. Does No Such Thing do this? Yes, actually, in his track form, which is where I got the idea from. Worth noting too, any good ideas in this tutorial are from No Such Thing, not myself. You can really learn a lot about someone through studying their music. Moving on to the sampler, which is just a super small chop capturing a syllable again from an Ariana Grande a cappella. This time it's Into You. Going back to my reference track, Realize, no such thing incorporated a similar sample that he brings in around 26 seconds into the track. I say similar, it doesn't sound the same as mine here, but it is a syllable that's been repeated with an auto pan, taking it around your head. He starts to introduce pitched variants of this 20 seconds later, with them sometimes landing together and creating a harmony. It's worth noting that there is some weird delays happening around the same time, which seem to be coming from the vocals. He may even be using the same delay plugin I am here. I'll play you a quick before and after with the crystallizer, as I'd like you to hear what it's adding in. So firstly, we've got before. And after. Before it's a super boring sample, but after it's got some interesting pitch artifacts that'll make people that aren't familiar with the plugin wonder how they were made, similar to me listening to the ones in Realize. There is a similar device in Ableton called Grain Delay, which I was playing with here. Again though, much as with the Filter Freak and the Auto Filter, I couldn't recreate what I already had. But that's not to say that it can't be done, perhaps I was just a little too attached to what I'd already created, being happy with how everything was meshing together. The idea of the auto pan down here was to get each syllable bouncing from right to left, giving it some stereo width and separation from other elements in the mix. There are plenty of examples of this in No Such Things Work, in fact, his use of the stereo field is one of the keys to his sound. Not just separating sounds, but how they move around the mix, taking full advantage of the space we all have available. I think if I could have expanded on any one thing in this example track, it could be these vocals. And there's lots of room, figuratively, to create multiple variations that could be born out of the previous instance as the track develops. This concept is something I plan on exploring in my own music, as well as hopefully in future tutorials. Moving on to the group channel, as you can see, I've kept it limited to just the bare bones basics. The EQ's job here is removing unnecessary frequencies. If I hadn't got to the first sample bass boosted to create that depth effect I just spoke about, I'd take this low cut higher, perhaps to 250 hertz, as we're working with the female vocalist, even though it has been pitched down slightly. The high cut is again for that depth effect, doing everything I can 
to sit them at the back of the mix. Although, if I play this sample, you'll notice that there's nothing much happening above 5k-ish, and the best practice is just to remove it. The glue compressor is controlling the dynamics of the sample, not that there's much to control, but nevertheless, a well-controlled mix is what we're aiming for here. There's no need to go into any more detail about that on the vocals. I'll now move on to the synths that are in two separate groups, which is actually to do with compression. Here's how both the groups sound together. I'll focus on this group first, as I'd like to go into more detail about the second. So this group is just the plucks, which sound like so. And then the second variation. The plucks are coming from Yuhi's Diva. Why Diva? Diva is the closest virtual analog synthesizer we have. Closest in the sense of, if you want a realistic sounding analog synthesizer, Diva's your best digital bet. The art area stuff is great, but Diva's a complete package and has something I've never experienced before. And that is the ability to mix and match modules to design your own unique hybrid synth. I can use an oscillator from a Jupiter 6 with a filter from a Moog and a Juno 6 envelope. And as you can imagine, you're left with some pretty unique sounding patches. I chose Diva as listening through No Such Things Work, it gave me a very analog sounding vibe, especially the pads and atmospheres. I can already feel the wrath from the people that don't own Diva, who want me to limit these episodes to Ableton only plugins. And all I can do is apologize, but the analog device in Ableton just wasn't giving me the results I needed in order to as accurately as I could recreate No Such Things sound. And I'm speaking more about the next group of sounds here rather than these plucks which can absolutely be recreated in Ableton. What I have done though is picked out five Max for Live devices that will again work in Ableton 10 and 9 and below if you own Max for Live that essentially give you more synthesizers and samplers to play with to really find what works for you. The second variation of the plucks are identical apart from I've added an instance of Crystallizer to create something unique for the second set of 16 bars. I've noticed in many of No Such Things tracks, rather than bringing in entirely new sounds, he plays on something that he's already been using to create a new version. This gives his work a natural flow, as usually the new sound is very similar to the old one, i.e. our brain recognises it as something we've heard before, meaning it doesn't jump out at us the same way a new sound would. This could also be accomplished through slow filtering or volume automation to introduce a sound over time, rather than just dropping it in on the next bar count. In fact, when I hear the latter, I always think of one of the first pieces of music production software I use called Mixcraft, in where you worked with 16 or 8 bar loops and simply drag and drop them to arrange a project. Going back to the plugin chain for just a second, you'll remember earlier in this tutorial when I covered the vocals, I'd applied a crystallizer delay on the chopped syllable. Now, I removed this syllable from the second 16 bars and replaced it with the crystallizer on the affected pluck sound. I did this for two reasons. The first is to avoid overpopulating the mix. Space, which we'll get to in the next chapter, is an incredibly important aspect of no such things work. The second is to do something I mentioned earlier, and that is introducing a new variation of a sound rather than bring in an entirely new one. You've already been listening to the pluck for 16 bars, so adding in the new affected delay keeps it sounding like a natural progression rather than introducing something a little jarring. I'm trying to cover the arrangement throughout each element I'm discussing, but I think the two tips I just mentioned will take you a long way in keeping things interesting as your track progresses. I'd like to now briefly cover some of the musical theory. For the most part, all of No Such Things music is written in minor keys. The keys that I found worked best were E minor, F minor and G minor. This track is in the latter. A helpful resource for figuring out the chords or notes contained in a key is the website looknohands.com. Link will be below. The notes F and D sharp are what I heard in his track Realize. I believe they're correct, they sounded right to me at least. 
I think the idea was to use these plucks as a counterbalance for the synth chords that play every two bars, which I'll take you through now. I'll get into some of the sound design behind these and expand on the theory somewhat. Here's how they sound. I've got four layers to this chord, or stab, whatever you wish to refer to it as. I considered taking you through me building each one, but realised that would be pretty long and I'd be repeating much of the information. I then considered just picking a single patch and recreating it, but I'm guessing many people won't own Diva and I don't want to leave people out. Also, seeing how one patch is built is a bit like giving you a fish to feed you for a day. I think it'd be much more effective for your own productions to actually teach you how to fish and feed you for a lifetime, per se. There really isn't anything special about the particulars of each synth patch if you don't understand the building blocks you need to create your own. I'd like to cover what I've deemed to be the most relevant areas of focus on a synthesizer. I'll cover oscillators, filters, envelopes, alophos, and effects, while discussing throughout each which settings to apply to get close to no such thing sound. I'll also talk about layering and explain what I've laid in this project and why, as I believe this is a commonly overlooked aspect when creating different types of synthesized sounds. I'm going to be using Serum for this demonstration as I like the intuitive visual layout, such as the ADSR envelope, and I'd imagine most people will have access to this synth. Creating no such thing like sounds in Serum, I'd imagine will be easier for everyone to get started. It's also one of the most popular synths on the market currently and is extremely versatile. I actually even designed most of my own drum hits in here. Before we jump into the parameters on Serum, I'd like you to firstly understand the concept of wavetable synthesis, which is the category of synthesis Serum harnesses. You guys on Live 10 will have the wavetable synth, so I'm hoping even if you don't have Serum, everything I'm going to be explaining can still be put to good use. Some of you may be thinking, wait, hold on, you're mainly using Diva in this project, while the switch to Serum, a wavetable. Well, apart from the popularity and accessibility of Serum and Wavetable, I'm actually using Wavetable oscillators in Diva. It has nowhere near the selection Serum does because it's more of an extra than a core feature, but I found Wavetable synthesis to be the best option for recreating no such thing sounds. But first, a quick overview and history of Wavetable synthesis. Between digital samplers and subtractive synthesizers lie wavetable synthesizers. Digital samplers are intended to reproduce a sound that ranges from a few to many second or more in length and provides some facility for manipulating that sound. Digital sampling requires fast access to the data required for playing back a recorded sample immediately on request, such as pressing a key on a keyboard, and is therefore usually stored in entirely random access memory or RAM. When RAM was expensive and available but only in much lower capacities than what we are accustomed to today. Samples were shortened with low bit rates, such as 8-bit compared with today's 16, 24, and 32, low sample rates, and mono. An attractive alternative was storing and reproducing a single wave cycle that was very short in the range of milliseconds, therefore requiring minimal storage space and RAM, which is where Wavetable comes in. Sample-based synthesis was a technique that for the first time brought with it the allure of faithfully reproducing the sound of acoustic instruments. With the increase in drive storage space, RAM capacities and processor speeds, not to mention improved techniques for capturing and organizing samples, sample-based instruments increasingly approached an impressive realism. The trade-off, however, was limited facility for crafting the timbre into variations expected in musical performance. For anyone approaching synthesis, Synthesis, with the goal of reproducing the sounds and subtleties of an acoustic instrument, it was still hard to beat what sampling had to offer. What was needed was having that realism coupled with the deep timbral control that was at the heart of synthesis. 
Addictive synthesis would evolve beyond its humble beginnings to address that need in a significant way. The next step was to start with a sample and not just play with its overall harmonic content, but to divide it into many slices over its duration and manipulate how and when the slices were produced. This is the basis of two similar but different forms of synthesis, wavetable synthesis and granular synthesis. Both wavetable and granular work on the principle of dividing up a sample into slices over time. With wavetable, the slices commonly referred to as subtables are relatively coarse older instruments would have 32 divisions over a sample's duration. Newer software-based instruments may go as high as 256. The slices of a granular sample are called grains and can be as small as 2 to 50 milliseconds each. As I've already stated, the two techniques share similarities, but there are distinct differences. However, I'd like to explore only wavetable in this tutorial. The term wavetable has been used as a label for different synthesis techniques, some more appropriately so than others, leading to confusion over what it is exactly. Some of the most common kinds include lookup table, vector synthesis, linear arithmetic synthesis, advanced wavetable synthesis, and granular synthesis mentioned earlier. Serum uses advanced wavetable synthesis according to their website. The concept of wavetable synthesis evolved from some of the previous implementations we just covered, namely lookup table, vector, and linear arithmetic synthesis into something more complex and useful for sound designers working on a door rather than on hardware instruments. In general, plug-in instruments continue a trend of blurring the lines between the different synthesis techniques I've mentioned in this video, and wavetable is among them. Advanced wavetable synthesis is not a common term in synthesis parlance, but one that we're using to describe the new advances in wavetable that borrow much from what we will see had been the sole domain of granular. Wavetable instruments still have wavetable to use as a starting point, but a new function known as re-synthesis allows importing your own samples that are divided into time slices called grains. The advantage here is that the grains are variable and start, end and loop points can be defined with the overall sequence or characteristics of granular synthesis but with fewer and larger grains. So looking at Serum, we've got a wavetable position control which is the start, the starting grain, which is currently set to the beginning but can be shifted completely through to the end of the wavetable. If I click here to change the view, Set up an LFO to the position control, change this to trigger and hit a note, we can see the position moving through the wavetable currently loaded. Serum gives you a visual readout, allowing you to see what you're hearing, which is why I wanted to use it. This is how you add basic movement to a sound, assigning the LFO to something. Usually the filter cutoff is the obvious choice, but I like the tones and timbres produced when it's assigned to the position control. Changing the rate of the envelope down here, as you may have guessed, affects how quickly the wavetable is played from the start to the end locations. And because speed controls only how long each grain is played, there is no effect on the pitch. You can see how quickly we are getting into the territory that has traditionally been considered granular synthesis. Now, because we've got an LFO envelope assigned to the position, we can start to draw in patterns down here. Just click to add a new dot and keep going until you have something you like. And that's really how I would approach designing a new sound in Serum. Select a wavetable, add an LFO to the position control of said wavetable, and play with the rate and shape of the envelope for a few hours on end. The idea is you then do this for your second oscillator, assigning multiple LFOs to each. From there, you can go to the effects tab up here and you're away. The visual programming style of Serum really allows you to understand what's going on and how to manipulate it, which is one of the many reasons I think that's led to its popularity. There are a few other things I'd like to mention though, and that's the definitions of the main parameters you'll be playing with on here, and what to aim for to capture no such things sound. There are essentially two primary sound sources in all of music synthesis. The oscillator, which forms the foundation of subtractive, frequency modulation, and additive synthesis, and then digital playback, the basis of sampling, physical modeling, wavetable, and granular, but the ways in which they are applied to create the finished sound varies dramatically. We'll start with the oscillator. 
The traditional analog method of generating sound electronically is with an oscillator, an electrical component that produces an electrical alternating current, or AC. A voltage controlled oscillator, VCO, the type used for music synthesis, accepts a direct current as control information to vary the number of cycles generated per second, or its pitch. The only part you should commit to memory is remembering that an oscillator is a repeating waveform with a fundamental frequency and a peak amplitude. Aside from the pitch and its amplitude, one of the most important features for sound design is the shape of its waveform. As we're not using oscillators in the traditional sense here, I'd like to focus on digital playback as a form of sound generation. In wavetable synthesis, single cycle complex waves are stored and looped under the shape of a volume curve. Serum also gives you the option to edit these waves and even to create your own. I'd like to give credit to Appleton and Alonzo at New England Digital who were looking to achieve more realistic and musical sounds within the limited capabilities of their computers who first thought to divide a sound event up into three small chunks, beginning, middle and end, and store them in a wavetable. Working with single cycle waveforms harkens back to the options of the early days of synthesis, but with a wavetable, the waves are far more complex. Rather than choosing from sine, triangle, square, and saw in a traditional synthesizer sound palette, the options are now expanded to a variety of raw sounds. And now we even have the options to create our own. When a skilled musician plays a sustained note on an instrument like a violin, you will notice that the sound is not static. Rather, it is shaped over time. Once musicians attain a certain level of technical facility on an instrument, there are ways of making a performance musical. Examples of this include a regular shifting over time of the pitch center, vibrato, volume, tremolo, and timbre. I'd like to look at the LFO tool now used for creating these time-based effects on the synthesizer. We've already covered the oscillator as a device that produces a user-definable waveform in the audible spectrum. A low-frequency oscillator, or LFO, does the same thing but in a range that is typically below 20 Hz and thus not audible on its own. The frequency being produced by the LFO isn't being heard, per se. Rather, its shape is used to manipulate the audible sound in some of the ways that you just saw. It's common, especially on software synths, for there to be more than one LFO available. Although they could be targeting the same variable, a great use of these extras is to set them to a different parameter. The next section we'll come to on a synth is most commonly the envelopes. How a sound's brightness and vibrato, just to name a couple, evolve over time can be manipulated manually with a controller like the modulation wheel, but they can also be defined as a characteristic of a particular patch. This is where the envelope generator or EG comes into action. A typical EG provides the following controls. Attack, which is the amount of time it takes for the sound to go from nothing to its maximum level. Decay, the amount of time it takes for a sound to go from the maximum level attained at the end of the attack stages to the volume level set in sustain. Sustain, the volume level, not time duration, at which the sound remains while the key is held following the attack and decay stages. And the release, the amount of time it takes for the sound to go from the sustain level to nothing upon release of the key. More complex envelopes may also include hold stages in one or more of the in-between points. A simple envelope will be labeled ADSR. One that is more complex could be ADHSHR. The hold forces the level to remain at a maximum for a specified duration of time before shifting through the decay stage to the sustain level. Now, there are obviously many other parts to a synthesizer, but I often recommend mastering the fundamentals before proceeding further up the hierarchy. I think working this way makes it easier to remember, making yourself much more comfortable when working with synths. Once you're happy with everything we just went through, filters would be the next element to investigate, followed by modulation, voicing, etc. Now that you understand and will recognize some of the terms, I'd like to take you through this layered chord. Here's a quick reminder of how they all sound together. And then one by one.
I think one of the misconceptions people have is presuming a sound they're hearing is a result of one synth, when the reality is there are often multiple instances of that synth with complex layering undergone to fit everything together. This is certainly the case for no such things since. He avoids the trap many fall into when layering, and that's not mapping out your layers across the frequency spectrum. To keep things simple, an example of this for a pad could be a low, mid, and high layer, respectfully. I originally had these three layered together, but something just felt like it was missing. I decided it was a more high-end bass sound to sit almost on top of everything else to provide a layer of clarity in the mix, so I did this. It's really easy to make if I take off both of these two effects, it then sounds like... It's literally just the default DOC panel oscillator settings. Going through the low pass filter set to around halfway and then going through the envelope to shape the sound over time, giving it the characteristic that you're hearing. I am doing some things with the LFO down here to add in some gentle movement to the sound. One thing I did notice in No Such Things music is that his pads and atmospheres are never static. There's always some slight motion to them. I apply this to all the samples in the pack with a resonance filter, sometimes even a tremolator. It doesn't matter to what you're using to get the desired sound though, just that you get there. The last thing I'd like to mention about the synths is the effects on this group bus. Obviously, it's imperative that these collectively sound as one. Building them up in the layering techniques I've mentioned is important, but so is how you process them all together. The first EQ configuration you've already seen and heard about, but the second one is done to replicate one of the characteristics of this EQ called Air. Slate recently added this into their Everything Bundle, of which I'm a subscriber to. It's around $11 a month, and I've been playing with it ever since. I'm one of those people that will spend half a day running sounds through different EQs to figure out which I like the best. It's no secret that you have to be careful when boosting, especially the high frequencies. Most EQs are just too sharp to really do much with. However, due to Air EQ's transparency, it adds a shine to the high end that I really like. Listen to the difference Ableton's EQ is adding to the synths while following the same principle. I'm effectively boosting the band of frequencies commonly referred to as the air band, hence the name of the EQ. It's very track specific, but this really lifted the high end and made the track sound much more fuller. When using a spectrum to analyze No Such Things music, I found that his high end is often only being occupied by hats and the top end of synths. Even though his is fairly low in level, mine was even lower, and it was evident to me before this that something was missing, but I just couldn't pinpoint what it was. Anyway, all that changed when I applied the fourth synth and this frequency boost which I've also applied on the master channel. The glue compressor is there to control the levels of all of the synths simultaneously, giving me a cohesive sound which I mentioned the importance of earlier. I compress synths usually harder than I would at drums, aiming for between 5 to 8 decibels of gain reduction because we haven't got the issues of the transients and I'd like to emphasize the cohesiveness as best as I can. These next two compressors are sidechaining this group to my kick and snare. I spoke about no such thing as use of sidechaining previously, but it's apparent in a number of his records that he likes to keep the kick and the snare as clean as he can with minimal obstructions. Ableton doesn't have a stereo imager, so I had to step outside again. Isotope makes my go-to imager of choice. I love the multiband functionality of this thing, and as you can see here, I've chosen to only widen the top two bands. We've got a kind of 2k to 10k band, and a 10k and above band. Not messing around with the lower frequencies of this sound ensures that my phase correlation doesn't go completely out of control. Also, if you spread out the whole sound, you don't achieve the nice wide top end to it, or you do, 
but it doesn't stand out as much in comparison. And that is another important element of no such thing sound. I'll be summing all of these up at the end in the five key takeaways chapters too. I'd like to spend just a minute on the arrangement. As I've previously said, I've kept this pretty similar to the track Realize, so I won't claim to have come up with the layout myself, but what I will do is my best to analyze why no such thing made these decisions. That's another reason I like basing these around an existing composition, as it allows me to analyze actual examples of their work. No such thing seems to have gone with a repeating pattern of two notes that sustain for less than a second each, with a release that mostly comprises of reverb. Just before the second chord, there's then a synth pluck playing two notes that kind of leads into the next chord. Rather than having these huge blocks of sounds, whether they be pads or leads, understand that you don't need to have them playing constantly. In fact, in order to create something more interesting and spacious mix-wise, it's better to leave gaps between synths that can be filled with drums and percussion. Without the two plucks, the track sounds a bit blocky because you haven't got anything connecting them, which is why no such thing's drums are extremely important, acting as the chain that holds everything together. It became clear to me early in this process that no such thing uses space like no other artist I've heard, almost treating it like an instrument in itself. I covered Burial in the last tutorial, and there were definitely whispers of him in no such thing's work in tracks like Glue, Tell, and Safe. Rather than planning what frequency pockets to place his instruments into, his approach leans more toward planning out where he wants to leave space and building the track around that. Although I would doubt he actually thinks all of this while creating his music, it's more that this is the sound he likes or wants to capture, so I think it's more of a subconscious action in his creation process, which of course we all do have. Alright, that was one hell of a long chapter. I hope there was some worthwhile rambles mixed up in there though. I've got the field recordings and the bass left, and then I'd like to finish by touching on the mastering. The bass in this track sounds like this, soloed. The bass, as you can see, is comprised of two parts, a sub and a more mid-range centered sound that's acting as the top layer, allowing the bass to poke through the mix a little more. It's also adding a fatness to the sound as I've got a chorus and some reverb on there to make it sound larger than just a sub wood on its own. Here's how it sounds soloed. Now, this is just a simple brass patch. They're available in any synth as a stock preset. The only important thing to note is that when layering sounds, remember to EQ them in order to fit them together like a jigsaw. Obviously, I already have a sub bass, so do not want the same frequencies present in this brass patch, otherwise they'll clash. The removal of the high end is making it more into a bass sound, ensuring that when it's played with the sub bass and the contents of the mix, it sounds cohesive and has one instrument. The group processing looks like so. I guess there's nothing new here that I haven't already covered. I will note though that it's worth removing all frequencies under 25 or even 50 hertz on the sub bass. We can't hear them and as discussed earlier, low frequencies in your mix require the most energy and therefore are eating up precious headroom on your master channel. If you want to ensure your track is as loud as possible with the biggest dynamic range, ensure all the unwanted frequencies are removed. Moving on to the field recordings, which sound like this. Within this group, we have four separate recordings. I'll take you through them one by one. Firstly, is water coming out of a pipe. And this is before all the processing too. And then with the processing,
The first two have identical processing, so I'll explain them both together. But firstly, here's the second sound without processing. And with The sound actually comes from an air conditioning unit, but after processing, it sounds very much like rain. My goal with both of these sounds were to add stereo interest to fill out the high frequency section of this project. The EQ is removing what I don't want and emphasizing what I do, boosting that air band we spoke about earlier. The auto pan is moving the sound around the speakers, adding in the stereo width that I spoke of. And the crystallizer is then adding in the interest. More specifically, it's adding in one octave pitched variance of the sound. Upon playing with this configuration, I noticed that both sounds become overpowering in certain sections of the track. So I panned one hard left and the other hard right, meaning that when the auto pan tries to pan, say, the right sound to the left, it effectively goes silent for a couple of seconds. And what you're left with is this kind of yin yang effect between the two. Check it out. I guess this was more inspired by No Such Thing than something I can attest to him doing, but I think it creates a nice ambience in this track. The next sound comes from a gas station toilet of all places, and sounds like this. I'm not really sure why I added this in here. It made the final cut, but I really have no explanation as to why. It kind of thickens out the track, and it's one of those sounds that you'd notice if it wasn't there, but doesn't stick out by itself. You could also use white noise for the same purpose. The last recording is the sound that introduces the track, the field recording from the French street. I spoke earlier about the idea of a real world recording, with me then slowly introducing the synth under it to make it sound as if this was happening in the actual recording itself. You can see that I kept it pretty neutral. The only thing I've added is some variation in the volume and the pan with the automation. This was my admittedly kind of lame attempt at making the recording sound more realistic. Perhaps if you were walking down the street with things getting louder and quieter as the sound sources were changing placement in relation to your ears. The group processing looks pretty similar to the previous examples. The sidechain compression is there again to ensure that these sounds don't obstruct the kick and the snare that I would like sitting right at the front of the mix, just as no such thing would. Also quickly, this is what my reverb situation looks like. I'm sending everything besides the kick and the bass group to the reverb. The amounts each are sent are dependent on where I'd like them to be sitting in the mix. Field recordings right at the back, and the snare much nearer at the front. I'd also always apply a high pass filter to my reverb bus to remove low frequencies that I'd like to keep in mono. Reverb can make a track sound messy extremely fast, so it's best practice to keep the low end away from it, which should also help your phase correlation. Try watching a phase correlation meter on something like Span and see what's happening when you're adding in time-based effects like reverb and delays. Moving on to the mastering, which looks like so. This first EQ's job was to match this track to my No Such Thing reference track, so the configuration is obviously track specific. I was lacking a large chunk of frequencies almost between the snare rim shot from 1k up to the hats in the top end of the synths around 10k. I'm also rolling everything out under 30hz on the low end for the same reason I mentioned earlier, headroom. 
The next EQ is for mid-side adjustments. I'm removing everything under 250Hz from the side of the track, effectively putting everything under that frequency in mono. Now I covered the importance of keeping low end in mono in the kick drum chapter, but with saying that, there are plenty of examples in which no such thing chooses to ignore this advice. So don't treat it as a hard and fast rule, leave it up to your own interpretation as to what the track calls for. I'm also boosting at 10k on the sides of the track, sweetening up the top end, adding in some further polish to those stereo elements. On the master channel, I'm aiming for around 3 decibels of gain reduction on this glue compressor, just something gentle that kind of works as a massage over the whole track. It's not there to be catching peaks, as they should be controlled on the individual elements. Because of that, I've pulled the attack and release times back, meaning they're both much slower to respond to the signal input, which promotes a much smoother action on the part of the compressor. An issue I had with this track was the snare being louder than everything else, so it was triggering the compressor and limiter way before anything else had a chance, resulting in effectively only the snare being squashed and some sloppy mastering, when I could just go back and balance it out much better with volume and compression. That's something to watch out for when producing music, which is when tricks like sidechain compression can come in useful. The limiter I then use hand in hand with this span analyzer from Voxengo, which is free. I'll monitor the RMS level, so that's the average loudness of the track, while playing with the limiter settings. Usually I won't go over anything more than 4 decibels of gain reduction while trying to achieve a minus 10 RMS level. If I can't achieve this, then it's time to go back to the mix and make further adjustments. Obviously, you could just run the track into the limiter, resulting in less dynamic range, leaving you with a pretty flat and dynamically uninteresting track. In my music and these tutorials, I'm always aiming for clarity, dynamic punch, and stereo excitement, so I'd say that it's important to have an idea of what you want out of the mastering, as that will determine the devices you use and to what regard you use them to. Okay, that's the track covered. I'd now like to leave you with my five key takeaways for No Such Things Sound. I've also got a blog post linked below that covers the five things I've learned from studying No Such Things music. Number one is space. The first and probably most important is No Such Things use of space, something that is apparent throughout all of his work. Treat space as an instrument in itself. Number two is stereo width. No such thing makes full use of the stereo space we all have available in digital music. Not just by placing elements in his mix out wide, but also by having instruments actually moving around in his mix. Number three is variations on existing sounds. Rather than introducing new sounds as a way of keeping his work interesting and exciting, no such thing chooses in many cases to create a variation of a previously existing sound, which gives you a sense of familiarity about it, allowing everything to gel together more fluidly. Number four is less is more. A common practice in music, and this ties in with the previous tip, is to keep introducing new sound after new sound until there's no room for anything else. Leaving space was the first takeaway, and an easy way to do this is to not only remove the unnecessary instruments and sounds, but to also discard all frequencies that are not needed. Number 5 is Beginner's Mind. I recommend searching into this to find out more information, but in a sentence, it refers to having an attitude of openness, eagerness, and a lack of preconceptions when studying a subject, even when studying at an advanced level just as a beginner would. For me, it's brought back that childhood excitement of anything is possible that I felt back when I opened my first door. To end, I came across another quote from Austin Kleon that I thought describes no such things work perfectly. In the end, creativity isn't just the things we choose to put in, it's the things we choose to leave out. Thank you as always for watching, I really do appreciate it, and I've got so much more I want to bring to this series, which I'm excited to show you all. Enjoy the holidays, and I'll see you all soon.